federal legalization and um, how this relates to insurance and some of the uh, topics that will be covered is a lot of the companies that are dealing with um, uh, the impact of technology uh, and how this relates with data and technology that ultimately will uh, provide the opportunity of eventually getting this legalization ties into the banking uh, and then obviously with these things it'll explode the market as far as obviously getting uh, insurance coverage. Uh, quite a few of the companies that will be speaking or individuals that will be speaking will be focusing on how they're overcoming the challenges of growing their businesses with these restrictions of legalization and then also um, uh, not having insurance coverage. Reggie. Sorry guys, Jeffrey, go ahead and uh, give us your insights on the industry, what's going on from your perspective and uh, let's rock and roll. All right, so well, um, every, every week in, the, in this forum, we tend to talk about what's going on in the industry and how it's being managed today. Uh, today what we're finding is a lot of people are still heavily involved in trying to get deliveries to their home uh, for their products and their uh, unable in many states to be able to go out and go into the brick and mortar locations unless it's considered an essential business. Uh, and uh, so people have the desire, even if they are open, not to try and travel out and to have deliveries brought to them. So really the state of the industry is that we're seeing an increase in delivery service. We're seeing an increase in the volumes of uh, people that are trying to uh, purchase and we're seeing an interesting increase in more medical cannabis doctors using features like Zoom or other uh, online ways to consult with their patients to get the message out on what they should be doing, what with micro dosing is recommended, what levels they should be taking, whether they're uh, edibles, whether they're smokables, whether they are uh, you know, using cannabis in oils and creams and tinctures and whatnot. But really, uh, everything has come down to the delivery market. And that's become a big part of our industry. So um, we see an increase in things uh, that, that are out there in, in this way. And I guess at this point, what I'll do is I'll turn it over to Joe. And he could talk about from a perspective of an owners of one of these edible manufacturers, what he's seeing as far as where the market is going and exactly what the uh, the situation is on the streets and what his salespeople are kind of reporting back to him. Sure. Um, first and foremost, guys, wherever you are, guys and gals, I hope you're staying safe, uh, staying home. Uh, obviously, what we're going through right now uh, is a bit of a paradigm shift. Uh, you have a market which is federally illegal, uh, yet in an overwhelming majority of states is operating quote unquote above board. Um, to Brad's point, this has made insuring these sorts of companies extremely difficult, but now we're faced with a situation where the in consumers experience, you know, we, ha we have a service in which is deemed essential. However, obviously banking is an issue in all cash business, this is an issue. And furthermore, COVID, and, and I need to dig deeper into this, but I heard it can stay on cash for up to 17 days. Okay, we're really putting, the government's putting this industry in a very, very vulnerable position. Uh, but from my viewpoint, it's an opportunity for us industry-wide to prove uh, to them that we can operate above board more efficiently and also cl close a lot of loopholes that have just been hampering down the industry for a long time. Uh, specifically to, to Jeff's point, delivery is exploding. It is absolutely, uh, it, it's, it is the new norm for now, for food, for, uh, for many different items. Sadly, I, I feel personally that this is gonna persist for a while. Um, so I look at this as an opportunity for us to shine as an industry. Um, I know in certain states they have uh, granted 90 to 120 day uh, delivery licenses for people. They don't want that to go fully into effect, but 
folks, I think, I think we really need to start searching for that solution immediately. Um, one solution that I would love to implement into my company personally, um, and if any of you have any knowledge to this, I saw a really neat bit about uh, these delivery vehicles, which have actual slots, okay? And, and to my knowledge, it hasn't fully rolled out yet, but it's in the works. Um, you can access that uh, um, safety deposit box of sorts with your own personal order, okay? To get into that box, you either have to have a retina scan or a, a fingerprint scan to access it, okay? For me and my money, one, this is technologically awesome. <laughs> Two, um, it really does provide a viable solution uh, for the industry wide. Again, the transparency is what we're all looking for. For me and my money right now, as an industry, what we're up against is being deemed critical services, yet not being given the same incentives for being, for, for being available to our people. Okay, so that's, that's issue number one. Issue number two, we can actually prove it now. We can prove it works, we can close the loop, and for me, I really hope uh, that this will wake people up to that, although this is an illegal industry, we can operate like all other businesses and actually save people time, money, energy, and most of all, make the end consumer experience better. Thank you so much, Joe. Again, there's a lot going on in the industry. It is um, fluid, it is dynamic, it is ever changing. I think the legislation will eventually catch up, uh, but there are tremendous opportunities in this sector. Um, can you touch a little bit more about your company in terms of what you're doing as a manufacturer and, and how you see that, uh, the edible space uh, changing and how, how people are, are more uh, looking towards using edibles as opposed to consuming uh, smoke? Absolutely. Um, you know, obviously uh, what we're going through right now uh, attacks the lungs. Uh, so socially responsible consumption is, is I feel at least, uh, is going to be more at the forefront of the consumer's mind. Uh, we've seen this reflected in trends statewide um, as well across the other states. Um, and, and as this virus works it, its way to, to the Midwest, um, it's, it's been kind of funny to see how, how so many parallels have been drawn, you know, within that initial phase of kind of all of us realizing, oh my God, this is, this is real. This is happening. Everyone went out and bought twice as much as they usually do on a weekly basis. They stocked up of sorts. Um, in the weeks following that has come to a slow decline, but within that decline in sales, there has been a rise in the edibles market. And, uh, and I, and I do believe, you know, for us in our company right now, it's an opportunity to educate, um, to also warn uh, against the, the dangers of, of inhalation uh, during this time. Uh, the, added, um, the added increased risk. Um, ultimately, of course, that's up to the consumer. All we can do is educate them, though. So some interesting research that I'm also very encouraged about out of Canada has actually um, seen that cannabis as well as tobacco, which I found to be very interesting, shuts off some receptor which is connected to, to lung activity. This particular receptor though, happens to control COVID coming in and attacking the lungs because that receptor is shut off by cannabis and or tobacco, it can't enter the lungs. And so obviously there's still some more research that needs to be done about this. Um, but my God, if, if it continues, if, if it is an actual viable solution, um, I mean, wow, you're looking at, you know, a real once in a lifetime opportunity um, that I don't think anyone could have ever predicted. So, uh, Reggie, to, to your point, uh, the market 
the market, the edibles market continues to grow. I firmly believe it will only continue to increase. And, and again, as we educate people um, on the benefits, again, of microdosing, of, of truly for me, to, uh, the, the consumer during this time that I want to reach um, is, the, is the person who's never considered cannabis, who, you know, maybe, maybe is a little bit anxious after being at home for three months, <laughs> you know, with one other person. Maybe they just need to, you know, take that edge off in, in a healthy way. Um, and so that's, that's really the consumer that I'm looking to reach during this time. Um, and, and I'm excited, you know, we've, we've tossed around some ideas, you know, ad space is very cheap right now. Uh, for us, we would love to come out with a commercial, um, you know, use this as an opportunity again to, to remind people that we are essential. Hey, we've been deemed essential. We're going to be here for you uh, through this and after. So uh, for us personally as a company, it's a time to define ourselves, our ethos, and what we stand for. Outstanding, Joe. I was reading this week an article, the weed map subpoena has the Fed's interest in the cannabis industry shifted. And that really was an eye opener as, as they go forward and start looking at this whole process of, of uh, the cannabis industry and how they're, they're, they're looking, uh, subpoenaing companies, um, creating uh, a little anxiety with the business side of the sector. And again, I think that the legislation won't come quickly, but it will come. Uh, we're still probably looking at a two to five year window uh, before we have any consistency nat nationwide. Uh, but again, as you've, you've said it multiple times, there are tremendous opportunities. I, I see the things that Brad is doing with the medical marijuana and the insurables, what you guys are doing in terms of um, uh, being able to um, deliver uh, quality, secure uh, payment processing things. I uh, see what the Oshan is doing in terms of working towards uh, his company expanding and and in the deliveries marketplace. So again, there's tremendous opportunities. There are definitely going to be some challenges, but business is always about challenges and overcoming those things. So let's let's. Um, Actually, back to one more thing before we get off that topic. Uh, let me remind everybody, today we're in a trying time. Today, the cannabis market is considered essential. Today, a lot of people are out of jobs. The cannabis market is a place that people can gain employment right now. Everybody needs to realize, because your primary job may have shut down, out of business, just a public service announcement that the cannabis market is open, stronger than ever, and still employing millions of people. So just to keep that in mind, during this tough time, people that are looking for work, turn to the cannabis industry. Look at CJ Rocks Consulting, for example. We still are helping people create new solutions. If you're a delivery company, what you wanna know about is the way that we can have your deliveries cashless. If you're delivering to homes, we'll put a cashless ATM in your hands. If you're delivering to a, a warehouse for a distribution organization or a brick and mortar store that is still open or a dispensary that is run by a doctor and it's still open, we have a iPhone or an Android platform that you can process your checks on and get right to the point. Before your delivery is unloaded. Instead of getting the cash, we can give you the check service so that your driver is more secure. There are two times in this world that you wanna be secure. And one is in a pandemic, and two is every other day of your business. Because everybody knows right now, there's one kind of delivery van that people want to target if they're looking to do harm. A marijuana uh, delivery van at about noon that has half its product and 50% of its cash is a pretty good day to me. So what we want to do is we want to help put the safety of the industry first, put and simplify your payment process for either the home delivery 
for the distribution delivery, and we are able to make that seamless transition so that you can know you're going to get paid, keep your employees safer, because at the end of the day, what our goal is, is very little cash coming back that saves you time, it saves you money to count the cash, and then also, on top of that, what you wanna do is focus and make sure that you just know that your driver is safe, secure, and zero issues because there's no cash left and there's no product left on that van by the end of the day. So having said that, I hope that that kind of helps. Let's keep in mind the cannabis industry is a big employer right now. We are going to help stimulate the economy. Moving on from that subject, let's talk about other things in the cannabis industry, such as the maturation of the CBD market. Now that we're seeing the maturation of the CBD market, we're able to start exploring the opportunity to go more THC. And people are becoming increasingly THC friendly. States are becoming increasingly THC friendly. Uh, Joe, why don't we talk about that? I'm gonna leave that up to you to uh, kind of take it from there. And then, uh, you know, talk about the maturation of the CBD market a little bit and how it's affecting the THC market moving forward. Um, sure. Uh, for, for me and my money, I, I've always viewed uh, CBD as the, the bridge to, uh, to people experimenting uh, and having an open mind about the use of THC. Um, just being educated on the benefits of CBD alone, uh, I feel sparks a curiosity uh, <laughs> that, that will inevitably lead down a rabbit hole that does have some science behind it. <laughs> it's out there, it's available, um, but sometimes you have to dig and sometimes you have to, to put uh, decades of misinformation aside. Um, so to that point, uh, I, think, I think as seniors, you know, the, <clears throat> let's say the 45 and up market, um, these people are primed and ready and, and probably have either dabbled and or experimented with cannabis at one point in their life. Um, but again, as the tide continues to turn, there's a reason why. Um, you know, I, it, taking a step back, I always just think about how funny it is that cannabis is the only industry that operates, quote unquote, above board but illegally at a federal level and has like one of the largest economic contributions to society. It's like, that's kind of, that's kind of crazy to me. Uh, but, but again, the tides are turning, numbers are cont continuing to increase. Um, ballot initiatives are, are very strong in multiple states. And before long, you know, we're going to have all 50 states saying that we want this in an overwhelming majority and a government which is saying no. The question is why? Um, I, think, I think everyone in this conversation knows to a certain extent, but again, what can we do to not necessarily convince people, um, but to, to just relay information that is actually factual? Um, and, and I feel that comes from human experience. Um, speaking personally, um, it's my belief that the quote unquote non-believers, it takes knowing someone. Um, you know, it takes a personal friend, a family member uh, that has had an experience in which cannabis saved their life. I so happen to be one of those people. I had herniated discs, I got hooked on painkillers, and you know, a lot of people in my life uh, did not agree with my decision to try cannabis, to experiment with it. But in the end, it ultimately allows me to be here today. And anyone, <laughs> anyone who loves someone can't just look at that experience and say, there's not something to that. Um, so for me, those experiences are driving um, the legalization. And again, I think it's, it's opening up this kind of Pandora's box to, hey, you don't have to actually get high to get well. Um, and so for, for us at our company, a big emphasis on our medications is that, you know, we, we provide for microdose to megadose, you know, from 
from that person who just wants to take off the edge at the start of their day with 25 milligrams of CBD and just one milligram of THC, a micro micro dose to amplify that medical benefit of the CBD. That's, that's the target audience that I am going for that. I want to make believers out of those people. Um, and, and so we've, we've partnered uh, and, and gotten into some white labeling discussions with, uh, with about two or three companies that are specializing in that 45 above, 60 above demographic. Um, and so I'm really excited to, uh, to again, uh, explore and see what speaks to these people from a marketing standpoint, um, and also just hear, continue to hear more and more success stories. And the bottom line is legal, legal cannabis is one of the fastest growing industry in the United States as well as the world. Again, it's newly legal and the industry shifts from the black market to the mainstream. It experienced unprecedented growth. Building an industry from the ground up takes a lot of hands. The cannabis industry has attracted entrepreneurs of all stripes, from cultivators, baiters to distributors to tech experts, all of whom want a piece of the multi-billion dollar pie. While the industry has already experienced rapid growth, projections suggest it's still in its early stages. With seemingly nowhere to go but up, you might be considering launching a marijuana business of your own, and this is a tremendous time to invest in a company, to look at the opportunities for you to start your own company, to really try to get informed and educated about this industry. And this is a complicated space, both due to its youth and the legal circumstances surrounding it. This Cannabis Industry Startup Guide is all about, or our discussion is all about educating people, <laughs> helping people to understand the dynamics of the process, understand that there's a plethora of opportunities available for each and every, every one of us. And anybody that really is um, looking to invest in this space needs to look at, as Joe said, those that are in the upper ages. One of our employees uh, at the factory, the um, manufacturing plant we have downtown, is about 80 years old and she uses it every day. And she has, she uses more sample cream than I get in the office than anyone else. And she's always my person that says, ah, I love this. I hate this. This one works. This one doesn't work. I'll tell you, hey, get me some more of this one. Again, that is going to be a tremendous growth sector as people mature. And we know that many people have experimented with smoking marijuana and um, doing all kinds of things. But the bottom line is we are going to see this become mainstream. It's just a matter of positioning ourselves and our companies to take advantage of the unprecedented growth. Um, Brad, you want to chime in? Uh, yeah, you bring up all some very good points. Um, what's interesting is um, last year I ended up going to Columbia for the first time and I um, I ended up meeting a guy in, um, at the end of um, August, and he ended up wanting help promoting his conference down in Cartagena. So this gentleman was from Atlanta. Um, he actually came from Columbia and started an insurance business. He ended up having a, a pretty successful operation and he decided to take advantage back in Colombia of his relationships and his family members. And he decided to it, do a variety of things. And what's interesting about this is that all of a sudden, uh, I end up helping to promote this event. We went from, we ended up getting 1200 people to attend this main event and over 400 investors came to an investor event in Cartagena. Now, Cartagena, I had no idea what Cartagena was. It's a beach city. Uh, it's very reminiscent of being in Miami. Uh, very, it's a beautiful place. But what's, but being down in Colombia, uh, you've got uh, two of their exports, which again, people always, the number one thing people know about Colombia right now is, in the United States is watching Narcos on Netflix. But the market, 
uh, they per se uh, in the U.S. market alone is about $100 billion approximately for cocaine. And uh, they say the number for cannabis is probably about $100 billion too. So if, if, if today the current, they say the U.S. market, again, Joe, you might have the numbers, supposedly, what, $10 billion last year, approximately. Uh, so ultimately, the, that, that, that balance of what we'll call the illegal market will eventually transition to moving from the $10 billion will now shift over, eating away at the $100 billion. But when I was down in Colombia, what you see is um, the beginning of the supply chain, um, and cannabis comes from all over the world but they actually do a lot of it. And then uh, what's also I did not know, but Colombia actually is the sixth largest exporter of all uh, agriculture in the world. So when you're down there and you start to experience how they're just got their le legalization and the challenges they have, what are they doing to come up to this market? So I just keep seeing all this information out there about the challenges and another point is in the in, in California, we just went over 1,000 legal uh, dispensaries or licenses. And again, a few years ago, it was 5,000 illegal. Supposedly, the number is down to 3,000. So I have a I have a, a company I've worked with, LA Cannabis Company, to use as an example. They, have, they actually have three uh, retail locations, dispensaries. They do about $20 million a year. And um, they, they basically had the challenge of all the illegal uh, dispensaries in the area still eating away at their market and undercutting their, their uh, sales. So it just so happens the state of California finally got a little bit of a budget to actually enforce shutting down a few more of these dispensaries in their particular area. And so their sales and the foot traffic increased 50 to 100 people per day. So what I guess I'm describing is I keep learning all the way from the supply chain from uh, cannabis out of Colombia all the way to what we have in California. Uh, it's just an ever evolving opportunity. It's just, it's really just, massive and uh so you know the um you know my input is is that you're absolutely correct the opportunities are unlimited and uh, anybody that wants to apply their skills in marketing or sales uh can segue from whatever they're doing and also be in this business too you know mr gambrell give us your two cents Yeah, I think that the numbers are still a little staggering for uh, the industry. I think that as far as with all of the uh, unlicensed collectives that are in the state of California, um, that's where I'm at right now. So I have a little bit of an understanding of the, the heartbeat. Um, I'm also understanding um, the industry as far as in the Oklahoma City, Oklahoma State area, because I've got a new dispensary or they're a nursery that they're just up and coming out there. So I understand that as well. So just trying to share some of the opportunities as well as some of the testimonies that we experienced in California with some of the other um, surrounding areas would help as well. Also, um, as well as um, increasing the number of uh, opportunities to eradicate, you're not gonna eradicate the black market. Let's just, let's just understand that. It's been around for a long time. Um, they're very intricate on how they maneuver. The objective is to get as much information and share as much testimony out with the full bio, metro, full bio spectrum. And when you're dealing with CBD and when you're dealing with cannabis, you have to understand that you need both. You need the whole bio spectrum. And if you're not getting the whole bio spectrum, you're not going to be able to treat whatever ailment. I remember when I first started to uh, administer some of it, they told me that um, this particular person wouldn't see too much because they had lost 70% of their eyesight. And this was the director of oncology for uh, Stanford. But after, uh, I'd say about four weeks of administering uh, um, some tinctures, 
and the eyesight started to improve, you seen a, a different doctor, and he was asking, well, who administered this, uh, this medicine? Well, I ain't administrated it because you have to understand a doctor's objective is to continue to practice medicine. And so you can actually live with it. That is the business side of it. But those who have an understanding and have those family members that have been affected through some of the man-made diseases, we understand that if we change the diet, we change someone's diet, as well as change their nutritional supplement, the body can rejuvenate itself. It takes 365 days for the body to rejuvenate itself. And so that means that you have to stop putting the carcinogen in your body and start putting good nutrients in your body. And it doesn't happen overnight. And, and because of it's so new, there hasn't had so many testimonies that have people sharing that this nectar has helped their families. So I think more people that are coming in, and, and as we all know, more people that are coming on board are not just the 45-year-olds, it's the baby boomers, the 50-year-olds, because they've been listening to the doctors for the last 30 years, and they're still in the same predicament. So in order to do something different, you have to, in order to expect something different, you have to do something different to expect different change. I'd love to piggyback on that PC because I, I do think, you know, at least for, for our company in Oklahoma, you know, our, our ethos is around total wellness. And, and I love how you explain that it, does, it doesn't mean just taking a gummy or taking a tincture. It takes a total effort. And, and that's one of the objectives of our company um, is to promote total wellness. Um, you know, it, it is, it is crazy because so many people are, are, are starting again. I'm going to go back to the marketing side of things. You mentioned, you know, the testimonials for us as a company, it's been difficult because as you well know, there's certain language that we are censored from actually saying because we don't have the data, we don't have the science, we don't have the science behind it. Okay. But again, people's word and people's experience are speaking louder than science. And that is, that is what is, is changing people's minds. And yes, it's taking, it's taken 30 years of not, tr not, uh, not uh, treating, but managing a symptom in managing it with daily medication. Um, that again is at the end of the day is not handmade. It's not from the earth. And, and, uh, and for me, it's just, it's, it's amazing. You know, I'll share a personal story. I have a 99 year old grandmother. Okay. Two years ago. And, and this is how I discovered CBD. Uh, two years ago, uh, Christmas mass. I, I didn't even think she was going to make it up to communion. Okay. Uh, I thought to myself, this is going to be Nona's last Christmas. Okay. And so just to manage her pain, I said, Nona, you know, I love you. Like, just take this, give it a try. Okay. The, the, the journey that she went through over a month to two month period, I can't even begin to tell you like how beautiful it was um, to see this woman who, you know, admittedly, she, she's afraid of painkillers. She's taken them for so long, but to see a relief, to see a smile, to see a change of pace, you know, to see her bowels finally able to function, it, it's, it's those type of personal experiences that, that one has to experience um, and just can't be described to, to convert people in my opinion. But again, to your point, the challenge with marketing, certain censored language, how do we navigate that? Um, and for me, my money, it's sparking curiosity. You know, it's, it is telling the first person experience um, in not a scripted way, but with very, very specific language that can be allowed. And again, can spark that curiosity. So. Oh, Sean. Tell us what you're seeing out there. You're out there in the young people's market space. You're out there in the entertainment market space. You're on the forefront of what's happening with social activity and, and, and influencers. I know you do a, deal a lot with celebrities and influencers. 
what do you see uh, both on the legal side and the uh, uh, regular side where people are still uh, engaged in this process? Um, what I'm seeing, um, like the guys had said, um, both black market and white market, they're not, the young people are not caring. They, they want the product. But I think the young people needs a little bit more education. They're just using it for recreation. So that needs to happen. But then far as influencers, by the way, yesterday I had a, a meeting with, and I'm partnering with uh, the chemist. Miley Cyrus is in. He uh, created the first, uh, he has a mint, a breath mint, has seven different um, THCs. He does distillate extract. So I'm partnering with him. And he was saying that this mint can actually, it has benefits also. So me seeing that, and he did, he's dealing with Jake and Logan Paul, some influencers, and um, they want to get behind it. But like I said, they still need more education. I think it's a lot of avenues that the younger kids can actually learn about it. But uh, it's just wide open. And on the legal, they, they don't care about the actual, quote unquote, uh, what I want to say, the, the, the politics behind it. They just want the product. And they spend in, they spend in hundreds of thousands of dollars. I dealt with a company out of uh, Atlanta that was dealing with the, um, the Amigos. They're getting behind it. Um, so, but far as how we can do it, I want to be on the legal side. But, and like you said, the black market, they don't, like I said, they don't care. So I'm just seeing so many movements um but the far as the edibles they transition to the edibles um it's just a wide open i'm still a baby at it i mean i started a delivery service maybe four or five years maybe seven years ago didn't realize it shut it down should have kept it but now i stepped into the tech world and i have some some programmers that we're going to build that next uh i want to say uh postmates of delivery and uh we're almost going to launch in about two days so we'd be doing beta, uh, beta testing for about a year. So the delivery aspect is, that's where my heart was. I believe that's what needs, because a lot of people don't want to walk into the stores anymore before COVID came. So I believe uh, they want to be transparent. They don't want everyone know that they're taking this, this great medicine. So, uh, but the young people, like I said, they out there with it, man. And I think they just need to be educated more. So that's just my input. Oh, Sean, what, uh, what markets are you launching your delivery service in? Um, I have my own platform. I'm not, um, I, I decided I won't be on anyone's platform. I'm a rival with a uh, Weed Maps. Um, yeah, I have four coders out of uh, Sri Lanka. Um, they won seven awards. I've been um, working with them over seven years. Um, we're launching apps the right. whole nine. So, uh, That's great. I'd love to connect with you. Uh, drop, drop an email address and okay group. i will yeah yeah i feel the uh matter of fact i worked for i worked for a few delivery services for the past three years just to see some of their intricate steps mm -hmm. and moves but i always said delivery was going to outdo the store anyway the brick and mortar for me anyway so i felt like see my problem i was telling reginald was uh the different states and i'm trying to figure out that aspect of it but los angeles man i mean like it's, it's still just something that needs to happen. Like I said, you want to be exclusive. I feel far as the cannabis, because everybody, uh, the recreational part is fine. Like I've been using CBD on my wrists and different things of that nature, but uh, I know the benefits because I have asthma also. So, but I would just, I'm glad the eyesight with the tincture, I did not know that. Me being an artist, I was a professional uh, hairstylist for uh, 15 years. So I got nominated twice for Emmy. So my eyesight was getting weak. So when PC just said, the tincture, I'm like, whoa. So I'm still a baby at far as what benefits that it has. But uh, yeah. Thank so you guys, so very much. Uh, as we move Reggie, forward. I'm gonna, go I'm gonna, go ahead, I'm gonna piggyback on that really quick just because that brought to mind, um, uh, Jeff and I attended a conference a couple months ago um, in New Jersey. And for the first time I saw a clinical cannabis um, I, uh, pharmacist and that to me i mean if there is a sexy profession right now that you can wrap <laughs> your head around my god i mean because because honestly like what what is the 
what's the big fear that people always end up dealing with? I don't know what's in there. I don't know if it's laced. I don't know this. All those stupid things, okay? All those things that you would never, ever think about with traditional pharmaceuticals. However, having that voice and, and that type of authority guiding you within your medical journey, I, I think that profession alone could change the way that the industry as a whole is viewed. You have one of those in, in you know, one pharmacy per X amount of square miles. I'm telling you what, like you're going to see the volume. And I think, again, that will start to bring about change very, you know, ever, ever so gently. But I think having someone like a clinical cannabis pharmacist, man, that's a sexy profession right now. Again, this all goes back to how the cannabis industry is going to keep employing people because we are an essential business in a time of crisis where most people are out of work. We can get you back to work. Our doors are open. We are thriving and we are not going anywhere. It's just becoming more mainstream and more people are recognizing us as an industry. And that's what's gonna help today's economy. And I think it's a great thing. I think we all have done our part and we just have to keep continue to do our parts in order to drive this industry forward, help the politicians realize that this is not a bad thing, that this is something that's gonna be good for society, good for medicine, and good for our economy at the same time. Well, let me chime in on that. Reginald Grant here again. The fact of the matter is there is a social stigma, social stigma related to this space. And that is probably generational, right? The older people are just um, adverse and people uh, that are very, very conservative are adverse to the whole thought of something transitioning. But you can see the same parallel in alcohol industry and prohibition. So we are at that stage in this industry where we're going to see significant social change. It's already very, very popular uh, across the board. Most people and most companies or most uh, counties, communities <laughs> now, for the most part, think it should be decriminalized. It should be more uh, mainstream. And as we get more social acceptance, then people will begin to put pressure on the politicians. But you can never ask or think about a politician acting quickly. They are politicians for a reason. They only go and give people what they think that the people want. And so the people's voice is speaking, but it isn't speaking loud enough yet. And it will continue to grow. This, this industry, there is no stopping it. It is, it is boundless in terms of the opportunities, but it is also fighting a battle where the big people that are employed in corporations and in mainstream uh, industries have to protect their personal interests. They want to protect their job. So they don't want to be perceived as someone that is using something that is quote unquote illegal. Even if it might be legal in their community, it is legal on a federal level. So I think we will see a shift, but the shift will be a progressive shift. And it's all about the process of positioning ourselves as business leaders to generate revenues, to create a positive perception, to put the industry in a good light and facilitate the, the process. In closing remarks, again, we're, we're a little past our normal 45 minutes. Uh, thank you everybody for coming on. Appreciate you, Brad Turner, for joining us and um, uh, O'Shawn and, and everybody else. It, it is a tremendous opportunity for us to have a conversation. Thank you, Leroy. And I know you're, you're back there, Jeffrey. Um, and again, it's all about having open discussions. Jeff, you want to make an announcement. We're gonna change our time that we're meeting and we'll still do this weekly, but we're gonna make a little uh, Jeffrey. Yes, okay. We are looking forward to continuing our weekly discussions. We are going to be on at a new time, and we're going to move things to a Wednesday uh, from now on, and we're going to start it at, at uh, 7 p.m. Eastern uh, on Wednesday evening. We're going to go to an evening event, and uh, we appreciate everybody taking their time in the middle of the day. We do realize that these um, forums are important for open discussions, 
and we want to try and drive more people that maybe can't make the discussion to have more voices be heard as we continuously record and publish these events. So uh, let's try it at 7 p.m. Eastern, and uh, we will go uh, to Wednesday. So we're looking forward to seeing everybody next Wednesday, 7 p.m. Eastern, and we will, uh, you know, speak to everybody then. Hopefully we'll be Brad, able to some people I'm out sorry. there that can join us. Thank you so much, Jeffrey. Brad, close out, mention again about your event coming up this month. So uh, on May 28th, we have a medical cannabis uh, investor pitch event. So we're going to have speakers uh, for the first hour and a half. Then we're going to have 10 companies present. Um, we also are going to have uh, 20 investor judges uh, giving feedback to the presenting companies. Um, I'd like to, uh, I've got complimentary tickets for everybody. And since uh, many of you actually, uh, I'd like every one of you to maybe look at mycureall.com and uh, download their app. Uh, I think that what they've got going is good for uh, your business, Joe, uh, and everybody else. And I don't smoke uh, or or use uh, THC, but uh, you know when I listen to Joe mention about percentages and and dosage and so forth, I think I'm completely lost. And uh, they've got a a technology to to help close the loop with data. Uh, and the purpose of their app will actually drive more sales. Uh, so it, it's a platform that could connect any other digital platform. But I think that you guys could also give some uh, feedback and see if there's any value what they have to move your business forward. But uh, anyway, you. Uh, if you uh, everybody here is welcome to uh, participate. And then next month, we're already lining up to do a hemp event. Uh, a lot of interest in doing hemp, but of course, we'll still be talking about cannabis and CBD also. So just want to make you so very aware much. I appreciate you. And again, we're, we're open forum. We want to have discussions. We want to make sure that we get information out there. We want to put the industry in a positive light. Uh, again, we know that the perception is generational. The adverse um, pushback in this becoming a mainstream industry is, is uh, generational. But it will overcome. It is, it is what it is. And we're moving forward. I thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, continue to have a, a safe day. Um, stay sane <laughs> as we're all sequestered in our, in our individual spaces. But again, the world has changed and we're going to have a lot more online activities. Uh, people will not go back to their normal activities in the same way. I don't care what they do or how they open it up. It is still going to be a changing dynamic as the world embraces technology um, and it has to use it, which means uh, what we thought would take 30 years to become a, a regular routine has now happened overnight. So, again, I'm Reginald Grant. Thank you so very much for joining us. This has been Cannabis Pitch Live, Athletes in Cannabis, and I look forward to uh, your event coming up this month. Tomorrow, I have my uh, weekly uh, class as to, for new people starting a business, so that's online. Uh, Saturday, we do a ESI pitch event, Athletes Tech and Business. But again, gentlemen and ladies, if you're there, have an exceptional day. We know a lot of people look at this after we record it and put it up. So please, love and happiness. Thank you so much. I'm out. Reggie Grant. Have a good Take day. care, bro. Be safe. Hello, this is Jeff.